Okay, so so far we have looked at different kinds of logic styles, right? Static CMOS was the first one that we spent the maximum amount of time on. Then we started looking at different kinds of loads, right? Resistive load, pseudo NMOS, right? And then move to a completely different type of implementation where we don't even have the concept of a load and a driver as such, where we use pass transistors, right? So we are sort of directly passing the input logic through to the output by means of some switches. So sort of just using them as switches. Each of these styles of implementation has some benefits and some drawbacks. Okay. Now what we are going to do today is look at yet another style of implementation, right? And sort of see what are the things that we can understand as far as that is uh, that style of implementation is concerned. Okay. So what we are going to do is let's start by looking at the pseudo NMOS once again. Right? What do we say in pseudo NMOS? This is VO, this is VI, and the PMOS transistor that is up here has its gate terminal grounded. Okay. What is the reason for doing this? So that the PMOS is always on. Meaning that if the NMOS is off, then straight away the output gets pulled up to VDD. Okay. But on the opposite situation, when VI is high, that is the NMOS is on, right? What ends up happening is there is sort of a conflict. The PMOS is trying to pull up, the NMOS is trying to pull down, and finally we have some kind of a balance which determines the output voltage VO. Okay. Now this is not very nice in the sense that now what happens is I need to be careful about the size of VO that I choose or rather the size of the PMOS that I choose in order to get a good value of VO that ends up causing a lot of prob problems in terms of my rise time and fall time and so on. Okay. So the alternative that we are proposing is what was the issue with this? The PMOS being grounded was good for the pull up part. Right? In the sense that when I want the output to go high I definitely want the PMOS to be on, that serves my purpose properly. Okay? But when the input goes high and the output should go low, I want to avoid this conflict. Okay? So the question is, can we sort of break up our computation, so to say, right? You can think of any logical any logic that we are implementing over here, we can look at it. as a form of computation that's being done, right? So we essentially need some amount of time in order to do this computation. What we're going to say is, let me break up the overall time that's available to me into two parts, okay? So I will have something where I do a computation setup, right? And then follow it by actually doing the computation. So this is with time increasing from left to right. Okay. So what exactly do we mean by this? What we are saying is I am going to take the overall computation that needs to be done and do it in two parts. Okay. And the way that I am going to go about doing this is I will say I am going to connect a signal over here. I am going to call it the clock signal. right? It is in fact a clock signal, but it is not exactly in the same form as you might have understood it in the under you know in whatever sequential circuits that you have seen in the previous digital systems course. Okay. It is this idea is exactly the same, right? The clock signal itself looks something like this. It will be low for some time, then high for some time, low for some time, high for some time, and so on. Right? This total stretch is the time period and this part over here is the called the T on okay and the duty cycle of this is T on by T C into 100 percent okay so typically what we would like for this clock is some kind of a 50 percent duty cycle right is that necessary we will see we will see as we go further in the discussion of what we are trying to do with it. Okay. Apart from that, my logic looks the same. What I am going to do is apply VI over here and take VO at this point. Okay. 
So how is this different from a pseudo NMOS? Instead of taking the gate and connecting it to ground, what I have done is I have connected it to a clock signal, something which varies with time. Okay. If I call the output Y and the input A, right? This is the clock. What will Y look like? What does the signal at Y look like? What can you say about it for sure just from what you know so far? Without knowing anything about A, can you say anything about what the value of Y should be? Whenever the clock is 0, Y should be 1, right, or VDD, right? Because whenever the clock is 0, right, the output should be 1. Okay, let me clarify this. I need to actually make this diagram a bit cleaner. What is usually done is I also put the same clock to an NMOS transistor that is below the one that I am actually using for computation. Okay. So now it is very clear, right? Whenever clock is equal to 0, the bottom NMOS is off, which means that the pull down stack has been turned off. Okay. The top PMOS, on the other hand, is on. Therefore, the output Y is going to get pulled up to 1. Okay. So what we can see is it's going to be 1 over here, 1 over here, 1 over here. Okay. In between, supposing the value of A was that A is equal to 0 over here, right? If A is equal to 0 over here, then what, do, what can I say about the value of Y in that in between phase in this section? Huh? Y will be floating, right? Why? Because the PMOS is off, the pull down is also off. Okay? So, effectively, what we have over here is it is going to be floating, but what does that mean? It basically means that it is connected neither to VDD nor to ground nor anywhere else, right? So, left to itself, what is most likely to happen to the voltage over there? It should remain the same. Right? There is some capacitance at that point, right? the load capacitance plus the parasitic capacitances of the drains at those points. They will hold whatever charge has been deposited on to them at, up to that point, which means that typically they would remain close to this. Okay? It may sort of decay slightly. Right? Why is that? There could be subthreshold currents or leakage currents in general. Right? Even though that PMOS transistor is supposed to be off, there will be some current going into it. Even though the NMOS transistor is supposed to be off, there will be some current going through that. Depending on which one is stronger, you could have a situation where some charge drains away from that terminal. Okay? It is a possibility. We cannot predict it because we need to know what the subthreshold currents are going to be in order to say that properly. Okay? So anyway, the most likely thing is that Y will remain at 1. Okay. Supposing though that A goes high somewhere here. Now what happens to the output? As soon as the clock goes high, not A goes high, as soon as the clock goes high, Y will go down. Okay, it will remain down until this point where the clock became low and therefore Y gets pulled up again. Okay, so effectively what we have over here is we have sort of a two phase operation, right? There is one part where I am setting up the computation by setting the clock equal to 0 and pulling up the output. I will always pull up the output irrespective of whether it should be high or not for the logic function, right? That phase, all these parts, right, are 
called free charge okay effectively what we are doing is we are setting up the output by pre charging it to 1 okay every time that the clock goes low i pre charge it and set the output equal to 1 right then i want to do the computation i set the clock equal to 1 and then depending on what the values of a and b and whatever are the inputs to the system are concerned right the output may either remain at 1 that is it will be floating but it will remain close to 1 or it will discharge and get pulled down to 0 ok so this part in other words and this part over here are called the evaluate phases where the function that I want is actually getting evaluated the actual computation is being done right what do I mean by the function in general instead of having only a structure like this I could have made it something which looks like this a whole bunch of inputs being fed to a pull down network right this once again goes through two phases I have the pre-charge phase during which Y is pulled up to 1 and the evaluate phase Y is some function of the inputs Okay. What do I mean by a function of the inputs? Basically, if those inputs are such that it should that pull down network should get activated, Y will get pulled down to zero. Otherwise, by default, it remains at one, and therefore, in some sense, the computation is already complete. Okay. So that's actually, in some sense, a slight form of cheating. But what it effectively means is that our rise time for a computation like this, right? How much time does it take for the output to become one? is effectively 0 ok why am I calling it 0 because the pre-charge phase that takes a certain amount of time but that has already done the computation it has already set it up with the output pulled high ok so if I have a chain of gates right all of them are pre-charged in parallel at the same time So if the logic through this is such that y is equal to 1, if this is the correct output, then effectively propagation delay is 0. Okay? This is slightly playing with words right what I am doing over here but it is not as simple as that you need to understand that this is actually important the fact that all of them got pre-charged in parallel there is no critical path that needs to be followed through this circuit in order to get the computation done ok so in that sense all of them it is that effectively the output is going to have the value as soon as you enter the evaluate phase ok what would normally happen with a chain of gates like this is there would be some delay through the first gate, some delay through the second gate, some delay through the third one until finally you reach the last stage. Okay. Even if the output is in fact supposed to be 1, it would take a certain amount of time for that output to come there. Okay. So this is one potentially useful aspect of this. Right. The more useful parts are with respect to how the system is actually constructed Right. in the sense that what was the main problem with pseudo NMOS that we have solved over here? The fact that there was these competing pull ups or pull downs, right? The PMOS and NMOS would be opposing each other whenever the NMOS was trying to pull down. Now that does not happen anymore, right? I have guaranteed that whenever the pull down is being evaluated, the pull up is deactivated, okay? So they will never conflict, they will never try to go in opposite directions, okay? 
what is the advantage from pseudo mass that we have got over here we don't have that big pmos stack or the pmos the entire set of pmos transistors that were required for cmos once again just like in pseudo mass we have one pull up transistor per gate okay incidentally the pull down mmos is optional right of course if if you say that it's optional then you do have a potential problem in the sense that during the pre charge phase you might have a problem with the pmos trying to pull everything up okay so that is something that we still need to look at right but effectively the advantage of pseudo mmos which is that you have a limited pmos limited number of transistors required for the pmos pull up that you have got okay you have a fast evaluation to output high just because of the way that this works what are the drawbacks or rather let's just see if we can list the advantages doesn't require a complex pmos pull up network Right. If the output required is equal to one, then it is already pre-charged. Right. The other thing is, what about static leakage in this circuit? Right. Let's think about what we mean by static leakage. That is the condition when all the inputs have stabilized. Right. and the output is essentially at either 0 or at 1 okay under those conditions what about pseudo mmos did that have static leakage dissipation what happens when the inputs are equal to 1 it means that the output will get pulled down right so in the case of pseudo mmos we have a situation where when the inputs are 1 the output would be pulled down the pmos would still be on there would be static current flowing from vdd to ground okay that in this case what we are saying is either the pmos or the mmos stack one of those is off at any given point in time guarantee right so no short circuit current in other words so this sort of gives us the reasoning behind why we would do something of this sort okay it turns out there are a number of problems with it okay some of which can be fixed some of which cannot okay so let's start looking at some other disadvantages or the problems with this approach what can you think of as disadvantages with this kind of structure you need a clock right that's the number one problem over here we are talking about combinational circuits and suddenly now i am saying every gate has to have a clock signal distributed to it okay it's not just that you know this is some clock which is one wire from you know some nearby place a clock signal in general has to be distributed across the entire circuit okay which means that it has to be sort of centrally generated in one place distributed across all of these things and now it is going to see a load capacitance corresponding to the inputs of each and every one of those pmos and nmos transistors right so that clock signal is potentially a very big headache okay right but let's say that for whatever reason at least for some small circuits or something like we have decided that you know i can take the overhead of a clock right i still see some advantages in the sense that the pull up part of it seems like it works very fast so long chains for example will evaluate very quickly right does it make sense for me to use something like this also remember i mean if you think of it from the point of view of logical effort without going into any detailed calculations what would you think of the logical effort of this kind of a circuit what what do you think is going to be is it going to be low or is it going to be high Huh? I heard some answer, but I don't know who said it or what you said.
what would we be thinking of when we are talking about logical effort? We need to know the input capacitance of this gate compared to an input capacitance of an inverter that has the same pull up or pull down characteristics. Right? Let's think about pull up first. The PMOS can be sized as I want. Right? Because it plays no part in the actual input capacitance. Right? So even if I make it relatively bigger, right, which means that it can recharge quickly, it will not affect my logical effort. Okay? That's number one. Number two is in the case of pull down, this is looking similar to a pseudo NMOS. Right? In the pseudo NMOS, we found that the pull down logical effort of the pseudo NMOS was actually better than for the PMOS. Sorry, better than this uh, referenced uh, CMOS inverter. Okay? Why was that? Because the corresponding sizes that I needed in order to get the same delay, right? When I scale them up so that I get the same current, turns out that the pseudo NMOS was better than the reference CMOS inverter. This is similar. In fact, it's slightly better because during the pull down, I no longer have a current which is going through the PMOS. I don't have that sort of extra load current to take care of. Okay. So just from a qualitative point of view, without doing any detailed computations, it is possible to see why this probably would have a good value for logical effort. Right? Remember, what is the idea behind logical effort? What is the input load capacitance of this gate as compared to a reference inverter that can both deliver the same driving strength? Okay. So from that point of view, it looks as though this is probably a bit better than the reference CMOS inverter. Very likely, if we do a detailed calculation, we will find that logical effort turns out to be less than 1. Okay? Of course, it is a bit tricky over here because logical effort, you know, you have a clock and you have other recharge evaluation kind of phases. So, even how do you exactly define logical effort, you have to be a little careful with it. But if you assume that we are concerned with, you know, the load capacitances and so on, then we can use that same principle and apply it over here as well. Okay? With that in mind, it looks as though this is probably going to be a little better. Oh, sorry. So, coming back to the disadvantages, right? what I mentioned just now is clearly an advantage of this technique. Disadvantages, one is the fact that you need a clock, right? Second, what else can you think of which are potential disadvantages of this circuit? There are some big ones, there are some big problems here. Huh? Recharging to one, why is there a disadvantage? That's not necessarily, we are using it to our benefit in the sense that if I have a long chain and the output is supposed to be one, then I'm happy that I've recharged, right? So by itself, it's not necessarily a problem, okay? The problem comes... And there's a load on the other side, uh, there's another uh, chain button which is being driven by this uh, CMOS. Yeah. And the recharge uh, charge is drained by the other side. The pre-charged is drained by the other side meaning how, they, how does it get drained by the other side? So uh, basically on the pre-charged side you are storing some charge in the drain capacitance. Right, on the drain capacitance.
Great. Okay. So it's a good point. Essentially, what you're saying is, I have this one gate over here. I'm just leaving it like this. I'm not saying it's an inverter or anything. Right? It is being pre-charged. Hi. Okay. It's being fed into the next gate over here. The way that this normally works is, the fact that this was high over here will cause this to start discharging. Okay. No current flows in here. Why? Because it's the gate input of another transistor. So by itself, this does not cause it to leak. Okay. But it does sort of point out one issue with this entire approach. Right? And in fact, this is a major issue. Consider what happens if I have a chain like this. Okay? All of them are pre-charged high. What happens when I go into evaluate? This input is seeing high. It straight away starts discharging. Okay? But what if this input was also high? Right? If this input was high, then this was supposed to discharge. This starts discharging, but should not. Okay? What do you mean by that? It has started doing some computation which it should not have. That is to say, it has started discharging, going down towards ground. If I knew my actual final equation to be computed, then this was a bad thing to do, right? But normally in CMOS circuits also this happens, right? The gate will start going down towards ground, then realize, no, 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 the inputs are telling it that I need to actually go up towards VDD. It corrects. After some time, it pulls back up high. How can this get pulled back up high? It cannot. Okay? So this is actually a major problem. It's nearly a showstopper as far as this kind of logic is concerned. But clearly it's not. If it was a showstopper, then we would not be discussing it over here. Right? There is a way around it. Right? But it is a major issue as it stands right now. Do you understand what exactly the problem is? All outputs are pre-charged high. Okay? But supposing one of the inputs to a gate was actually supposed to be a low, which means that the output was supposed to remain high, right? That's not going to happen under this condition, right? Effectively, what it's telling me is that if I have a situation where one of the gates was supposed to retain an output high, it will have trouble doing that because as soon as I go into evaluation, it will see a one on its input, start discharging. After some time, I will realize that no, 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 you know, the previous gate has actually discharged. This one should not have discharged and will get stuck at a voltage somewhere between 0 and VD. Okay. Okay. So this is potentially a big problem, right? But what it tells us is that we can actually use this and try and understand it a bit better. Effectively, what it's telling us is, look, any time that the out uh, that the input of any gate during the evaluation phase, if the input to any gate goes from 1 to 0, then I will have this problem. Okay? During evaluation, if input to a gate goes from 1 to 0, I have a problem. One way of getting around it would be, what if I had the opposite situation, that somehow magically my input was at zero to start with, right? According to this kind of circuit, it could not be because they would all have been pre-charged. Okay. But what if my input somehow was zero to start with, right? And it then went from zero to one somewhere along the way. That is okay. 
right? Why is that okay? Because when, it, when the input was 0, it is not doing anything to the output, it is leaving it alone. But as and when it becomes 1, it causes the output to discharge, which is fine, which is what it is actually supposed to do. So in other words, this input over here has evaluated at some point from 0 to 1, it can cause the output to discharge. Okay. So this is a clue for us, we will use it later when we are fixing the problems with this. Right? So one of the disadvantages is discharge of the evaluate phase even if input is falling. Okay. Now there are still more problems. Let's consider one of them. Let's say that I'm trying to do a NAND gate using this approach. Consider the situation A is equal to 1, B is equal to 0. What should the output be? It should not discharge, right? It should remain at 1. Why should be equal to 1? Because A and B is 1 dot 1 and 0 is 1. Okay? What happens over here? when I am in the evaluate phase. This is off, right? This PMOS is off by definition of the evaluate phase. This is on. What about A and B? A is on. B is off. What happens? What do you expect will happen to the voltage over here? Huh? Why will it decrease? So what is happening over here? You have some capacitance associated with this. This is Cl plus C parasitic of the PMOS plus C parasitic of A, the brain of A, right? What is the capacitance here? This is going to be equal to some C parasitic due to the AB and MOS. Why am I calling it an AB and MOS? Because most probably that source of A and brain of B are one shared region, right? I might not have two separate things connected by a wire, I'll probably just share them in my layout. But there will be some region corresponding to that, it will have a capacitance associated with it. Okay? So fine, if I have this, what do I have when I have something of this sort? I effectively have a situation where this is, I'll just call this as, you know, I'll just call it CL to start with. And I'll call this CP. Okay, so this is CL, this is CP. This is initially at VDD. This I will assume is initially at ground. May not be, but that's the worst case. Right? That B was 1 and then turned to 0 at some point. Okay. What will happen to the voltage here? Huh? It will become charge sharing right, between the two capacitors. So what we will have is we will end up with a voltage which is Cl by Cl plus Cp into Vdd. Why? Because the initial charge was Cl into Vdd across the single capacitance Cl. After that A is turned on, it now has to get shared between the two, right? Now, you know, the CL was charged up to VDD in any case, right? So that CL into VDD was there on that CL capacitance. 
I am considering the worst case now where initially A was off, B was on and CP was therefore discharged to 0. Then A turned on, B turned off and I need to do this kind of charge share. Okay? Now what happens? Effectively what we are saying is V by the output at Y depends on what are the relative values of those capacitances, the CL and the C parasitic which is sitting in the middle. Okay. So that is bad news for us. Effectively it means that there will be some decrease in the output voltage which is determined by parasitics. We have no real control over it. Right? We can sort of say yeah, what, whether we need to make something bigger or smaller but the only way to make this like really small is to make CL much larger than CP which may not be something that we want. We do not necessarily want to make the load very large. Okay? So this kind of charge sharing is an issue. Okay. No, in CMOS it cannot happen. In CMOS, that's that's the whole point of being static. What happened over here? Why did it happen in this case? Why was floating? It was no longer being pulled up. Why was supposed to be one? But the PMOS was not actively pulling it up to VDT. Right? I have turned off the PMOS during the evaluation. That is why this happens. In the case of static CMOS, that static is actually very important. Right? It actually plays a very useful part over there. When the pull up is when the pull down is turned off, the pull up is going to be on, which means it is good. When the pull up is off, the pull down will be on. So it will actually pull it down to zero. Why cannot be one at that point in static CMOS? Right? So that's the thing. That complementary part of static CMOS makes sure that at any given point in time, one of those two networks is on. So your output is actively connected to either VDD or to ground. Over here, it is floating during evaluation. It could be floating, right? If the pull down network was completely on, then it is being actively pulled down to ground. But if the pull down is not on, then it is essentially floating and the voltage over there is determined by various other factors that are only very limited way in your control. Okay? So charge sharing in other words is a major problem again as far as this is concerned. Right? A similar related problem is charge leakage. Right? Because we have a floating output during evaluation. Right? What this basically means is that it does not really matter whether that A was 1 and B was 0 and charge sharing happened. Supposing, you know, A is equal to 1 or rather, you know, just the fact that even if both of them were off, A and B were both off, some subthreshold currents could still be flowing over there. Some subthreshold current will flow through the PMOS because that is also in the off state. The net voltage at Y is going to be determined by which of those currents is going to be greater. Okay. And in general, it is sort of difficult to predict, it could cause a decrease in that voltage. Right? There is one more issue that comes in over here, which is related to the fact that I have this clock, uh, clock signal over here, which is continuously going 0, 1 and so on, right? And when the pull down network is off, right, effectively what that means is it is completely just whatever change is there with the clock can be capacitively coupled by the gate to source capacitance or a gate to drain capacitance of the PMOS. There will be some gate to drain capacitance. Right? What that means is that an increase in the clock voltage will show up as an increase in Y. A decrease in the cl clock voltage will show up as a decrease in Y. How much? Not a very large amount. But while doing your simulations, you would already have seen that when one input goes up, the output could potentially overshoot. It can go above zero, above VDD or below zero. Right? before sort of finally settling to a correct value. 
Why does that happen? Because there are some capacitances over there that are trying to hold their, you know, that are preventing an instantaneous change in voltage. Right? How do they respond? They say, essentially say that, okay, if you try increasing the voltage here, I will have to respond by also letting that voltage show up as an increase at the other end. So there is a spike over there, which then sort of settles down. How much is that spike? How quickly does it settle? That's all determined by the value of the capacitance. Okay? These capacitances that I am talking about here are not large, but nevertheless there will be some signal change over here, right? This will see some potentially a ripple of this sort or something else like that, right? So Y is affected by so called clock feed through. Not a very large change in Y, but some noise nevertheless. Okay. So there are a whole bunch of disadvantages that you can see as far as this kind of logic is concerned. Right? By the way, the name given to this style of logic where we use the two different phases of operation, right? The pre-charge and evaluate. This is overall called dynamic logic. Okay? Dynamic in multiple ways, essentially the computation itself does require this kind of two phase operation, pre-charge followed by evaluate. So there is activity happening no matter what. The other thing is the fact that it, as opposed to static, where in static you have an active pull up or pull down which is taking your output to either VDD or to ground at any given point in time. Whereas over here potentially you could have outputs that are floating. Okay. So the question that we need to answer is how can we fix at least some of these problems so that this overall thing can be made useful. Right? And if we go back and look at the problems, what we find is the biggest issue was this business with the fact that if an input error needs to go from 1 to 0, right, during the evaluation phase, that's going to be a problem because it will cause my output to start discharging and then it can never go back up high. Okay? So how do we fix the input falling problem? Right? What I am going to say is one proposal for this is to say I will take this structure that I have over here. Right? That way I am going to make this optional. Why is that bottom end mass optional? What will happen if I don't have it? During pull up, there will be a conflict between, there could be a conflict between clock and the pull down network. Right? It may happen, it may not. If you are lucky and the pull down is such that it is not active, then there will be no conflict at all and it just works fine. If there is a conflict, then you can still fix it by sizing. You just need to make sure that the clock can pull it up sufficiently. Okay. So, at least at first cut, it may be possible to get by without worrying about that. Okay. So, I will just, from now onwards, I will leave out the bottom end mass. Like I said, having it there is better in terms of the overall, the clean <coughs> functioning of the circuit. But even without it, it will still continue to function. Okay. What I am going to do now is take this output and put a static CMOS inverter after it. This need not be a large inverter, but I am not talking about the size right now. I am not concerned about the size of the inverter at present. Let us leave that out of the picture. Let us just assume that I have put an inverter over there. Okay. How does it fix the problem? Effectively, what this is saying now is, now all outputs, the output is defined as this way, the output of the inverter are pre-charged low okay? 
during the computation phase y can go from 0 to 1 or remain at 0 ok so what happens if it remains at 0 the pull down network which was off or rather which was off because of the bottom end mass remains continues to remain off ok and there is no influence on the output if the output you know the, the inverter essentially causes the output to go high right that could potentially turn on the next stage pull down network cause that to evaluate and the output of that so what would happen over here is something like this Let's say y1 goes from 0 to 1. After that, TDM2 discharges. X2 goes from 1 to 0. And y2 will go from 0 to 1. Okay. This is actually completely solved your problem, right? Because as long as I make sure that the inputs to such a gate are coming from other similar gates, right, which also have the same behavior that they have some logic with an inverter at the output, I am guaranteeing that all those inputs are pre-charged to zero, which means that their default state at the end of the pre-charge phase is that all inputs are at 0, all inputs to all gates, ok, except for whatever some primary inputs which are coming into the overall system for evaluation. Then again the evaluation phase, they will start looking at those things and evaluate, ok. So what happens over here, this one evaluates. pulls down, this causes this to rise, that in turn causes this to fall down, causes this to rise. If there was another gate over here, it would cause this to fall, this to rise and so on. Okay? So in other words, I effectively have a chain over here where falling transition, falling transition, falling transition and so on. Okay? And this is how any logic computation that I have from the input will propagate through to the output. That is, if it is required for the final output to become 1. Okay? Remember that these falling transitions are on the pull down network that is then getting inverted and the actual output of that gate is going from 0 to 1. Okay? So because of this, this kind of logic has a specific name given to it. Right? It is called domino logic. How many of you know what Domino's are? Not the pizza. But if you have seen the pizza, and of course all of you have seen the pizza, what's the symbol that they use over there? Right? They have some kind of a rectangle with some dice kind of shape, you know, markings on it. Right? It's actually a game, not very popular in India, at least I never played it. Right? But it's a game which is used by sort of stacking up those kind of dominoes and you place, there are some complicated rules with that. But what people usually do instead is they take those domino blocks, set them up one next to the other and then push one end, wait for everything to topple over. Okay, that's a game by itself. Right? This sort of resembles that. You pre-charge, set everything up, evaluate by starting at one end. It topples, 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 causes all of them to ripple through. Okay? 
So the domino logic, in other words, solves the main problem with dynamic logic, which is the fact that you should not have an input going from 1 to 0. It guarantees that all inputs can either remain at 0 or go from 0 to 1. Okay. So we will look a little bit more at it in tomorrow's class just to finish it for now.